Welcome to the uh, lecture where we are discussing the uh, stability of uh, the solution to a reaction diffusion equation. Okay, and uh, what we did till the last time was we found a solution which was spatially uniform, which was basically uh, saying that the steady state was zero for all uh, values of the parameter. Okay, and we decided we asked the question whether such a solution is stable because if it's stable, that means you will actually observe it. If it is not stable, that means you are not going to observe it. Okay, so that was the question which we wanted to find out uh, the answer to. And in the process, what we did was we found the steady state, we did the linearization, and this was the linearized equation. Now, what you uh, have to remember is that you SS equals 0 is a steady state for all values of A, D, and L. It is always a steady state. Okay, that is something which I want you to remember now uh, because uh, re recall that USS equals 0 is a steady state for all A. A is something like a reaction uh, rate constant, okay. D is diffusion coefficient and L is the length of the uh, thickness of the catalyst. So, these are the three physical parameters. No matter what you take for all combinations, this is always uh, a possible steady state, okay. Now, the question is, will we observe this? That is the question and answer is yes, if it is stable, that is the answer. But the question is, when is it stable and that is what we are trying to find out, okay. So, when is this stable, that is the next question and that is what we are trying to find out now, when is this particular steady state stable. So, in the process, what we have to do is we have to solve this uh, linear equation which is subject to homogeneous boundary conditions, okay. The boundary conditions are u tilde equals 0 at x equals 0 and L, okay. And since it is a linear equation, we decided to seek a solution in the form of uh, so variable separable form and we substituted this here and then we get this e uh, equation and with a little bit of rearrangement, you find that the left hand side is a function of time, the right hand side is a function only of x and the only way these two functions can be equal is if both of these are equal to a constant. So, what I am going to do now, so since it is a constant, there are basically three possibilities. The constant can be positive it could be 0 or it could be negative, okay. So, this constant can be positive 0 or negative, right. What we are looking for is a non-zero solution to this differential equation. I mean, zero is a solution always, but if you get zero as a solution, that means what? Your perturbation is zero, but what we want is given a particular perturbation, as time goes to infinity, we want to find out how the system is going to behave. So, we are interested in finding out a non-zero solution. So, I am going to claim and this is something you people have to verify that if this constant is positive or if this constant is 0, the solution to this equation, the second order equation x is going to be 0, okay. What I am saying is if this constant is positive, let us say lambda squared plus lambda squared, okay, 
R 0. I am saying plus lambda square, lambda square just to tell you it is positive and a plus sign in front. This tells you no way this guy can be negative, right? On 0, the solution to this equation actually, uh, yeah, the equation, which equation is this? d square x by dx square multiplied by d plus ax equals lambda square x is 0 when it is subject to the boundary condition x of 0 is equal to x of l equals 0. So, how do I get these boundary conditions on x? These come from the boundary conditions on u. u is 0 at the 2 ends. So, the only way u can be 0 at the 2 ends is if x is 0 at the 2 ends. So, x has to be 0 at the 2 ends and then if x is 0 at the 2 ends, I am saying if you solve this equation, the solution is 0 if you have plus lambda squared. If you have d, d squared x by dx squared plus ax equals 0 subject to x of 0 equals x of l equal to 0 also has only the trivial solution x equals 0. You understand? And I want you to verify this. You can just uh, proceed, do the algebra and find out. Find the uh, solution to this, put the boundary conditions and see if you can get a non-zero solution. Okay? However, if the constant is negative and I am going to indicate that as minus lambda squared, then this equation d x double prime for the second derivative plus a x equals minus lambda squared x admits a non-zero solution. And this is Basically, uh, what you have done all along in your separation of variables uh, solution, in your separation of variables solution, you uh, have assumed this constant to be equal to minus lambda squared and you have proceeded. Okay? So, the reason why you proceed, uh, assume it's minus lambda squared is because that is the thing which gives you the non-zero solution and that is what you want. If you assume plus lambda squared and you will find that it gives you only the zero solution. If you assume zero, you get only the zero solution. Okay? So, the reason I am just trying to justify uh, why I am putting minus lambda squared. Okay? Now, which satisfies both the differential equation and the boundary condition. So, what is the uh, non-zero solution which uh, will satisfy the differential equation and the boundary condition. I am going to claim and this is something which you people have done whenever you have done the separation of variables. Like for example, sin n pi x by L. This is in fact you will have sin as well as cosine, but because of the boundary conditions you can prove that the cosine term does not exist, only the sine term exists. Okay? Um, in fact, what I need to do is yeah. A and sin n pi x by L satisfies the boundary conditions. Does everybody understand this? A and sin n pi x by L, see, I am saying this solution xn of x, this, this satisfies the boundary conditions. Okay? And uh, you can possibly do this in a slightly more formal way. But since I have done this problem so many times and since you have also done this problem uh, in calculus, you should uh, be able to figure out that I am just jumping a few steps. But although it satisfies the boundary conditions, I have to make sure that it satisfies the differential equation. right? And uh, what I do not know yet is the lambda squared. I do not know what lambda squared is. Okay, so I am going to substitute this here and find out that the lambda squared 
what it is in terms of this n pi and the other stuff. That's the plan. Okay. So to find lambda, what I'm do, I do is I just substitute this uh, the second derivative, which gives me a substitute the solution in the differential equation to find the lambdas. Okay. So let's do that. What do you get? You have the d, you have the a n and when you differentiate it two times you get minus n squared pi squared by l squared okay, multiplied by sin n pi x by l plus small a multiplied by capital A and sin n pi x by l equals minus lambda squared capital A and sin n pi x by l. Okay. So, this is a typical eigenvalue problem which you people have come across before okay. and you know that the solution is sin n pi x by l. I am just exploiting that knowledge which I already have in proposing the solution. Only thing is normally your eigenvalue problem will not have this A x term. Now, there is an extra A x term here. You have solved problems where you have x double prime equals minus lambda squared. So, yeah. All I am doing now is I am going to uh, realize that a n sin n pi x exists everywhere and so this e equation because I am interested in the non-zero value so a n sin n pi x is not 0, I can cancel it off and what I get is the diffusion coefficient multiplied by n squared pi squared by l squared plus a must equal minus lambda squared. Okay, and uh, so basically, what I'm trying to tell you is that the lambda squared, and remember, what is n? N goes from one, two, three, etc. It's an integer. Okay, and correspond to different values of n. I will have different lambdas, so I'm going to put a subscript n here. Now, I put this constant as minus lambda squared. So, what will be the uh, solution for the capital T? The capital T of T is going to be of the form e power minus lambda n squared T. Okay? That will be the solution for capital T. Now, so I am saying that the u tilde is if you remember your separation of variables, it is going to be summed over all these n's and it is going to be of the form e power minus lambda n squared t sin multiply, uh, applied by a n sin n pi x by l. Okay. So, this is basically how the perturbation is going to change with both space and time. Now, just to, uh, this is the mathematical solution which we have obtained, but I want you to think of this thing in slightly in physical terms. When you are giving a perturbation or a disturbance to the solution, the solution is us is equal to 0, you are given some perturbation. What happens because of this perturbation? In some points, instead of 0, you will have a non-zero value for the concentration, for the u. Okay? And the perturbation is the deviation of the actual value from the steady state. So, what we are, can do is, we can think of the, the perturbation at time t equal to 0 which is when I am starting the experiment as going to be some function of x. It is a function of x in the interval from 0 to L. Now, 
if you were to extend this function of x periodically, okay, you can basically represent this function of x in the form of a Fourier sine series. So, what we have done is th think of an arbitrary perturbation. If you had expanded this in the form of a Fourier sine series, the at time t equal to 0, these coefficients would basically tell you the, how this particular function, how this particular disturbance is resolved in along these components. So, this is just like resolving a vector in terms of some basis vectors. You take an arbitrary vector, you can write it in terms of some basis E1, E2, E3, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1. Okay. So, the way you should look at this is look at the, some function which is your perturbation at time t equal to 0 is resolved in terms of these eigenfunctions, okay, this sign. And now the question is our interest is to find out how do things uh, behave as time t goes to infinity. Clearly, that is going to be decided by the lambda n squared. Okay. There is already a negative sign here. So, if the lambda n squared were negative, then the negative and negative would be positive and you would have the thing blowing up, becoming unstable. If lambda n squared is positive, then it is going to decay. Okay. So, let me just uh, summarize what I would have said and then how do you calculate lambda n squared? That basically depends upon the diffusion coefficient, the geometry, the rate constant. That is what you want. Okay. So, that is the basically the uh, link and the loop which you are trying to close. So, um, at time t equal to 0, we give a perturbation okay. and uh, this is u tilde of x comma t equal to 0. Okay. And what I am saying is when I write u tilde of x comma t equal to 0, my solution is a n sin n pi x by L. I am just saying that what we are doing is we are, this is a function of x. I am resolving this function of x in terms of these basis functions just like you resolve a vector in terms of basis vectors. Okay. So, this is the sin n pi x by L are my basis functions and we resolve the disturbance in uh, along these components. Okay. That is the way I would uh, want you to look at this physically, not mathematically of course, you got the solution. Okay. Now, so how does each of this, like for example, in the finite dimensional problem, you had uh, a vector disturbance, you had two eigenvectors and you wrote it in terms of two eigenvectors. Instead of two eigenvectors, I have an infinite sum now where this in summation is going from n equals 1 to infinity. So, from what was a finite dimensional uh, problem, we have moved to an infinite dimensional problem. Okay. So, this is uh, our basis functions okay. and uh, the evolution of the disturbance is given by uh, e power minus lambda n square t, okay? the time dependency and what we are interested in is as t tends to infinity, the guy has to go to 0. So, if lambda n square is positive for all n, then as t tends to infinity, u tilde tends to 0 and we have a stable steady state. Okay. Else, the steady state is unstable.
So now, remember, lambda n squared equals d times n squared pi squared by L squared minus A. Okay. So, I have different eigenvalues, lambda 1 squared will be d times pi squared L squared minus A, lambda 2 squared is and so on and so forth, right? Yeah. So now, what do I want? If lambda n squared is positive for all n, then we have a stable steady state. Okay. So, if lambda 1 squared, um, if d is less than or d pi squared by L squared minus a is less than 0. Okay. If d pi squared by L squared minus a is less than 0, that means this guy is positive. Um, I do not like this. I am doing something wrong. Yeah, uh, have I done something wrong here? Now I want lambdas to be negative for stability. Okay, if, so if the lambda no lambda squared positive for stability, right? I want lambda squared to be positive. If this is greater than zero, then um, all then we have. Stability for uh, the system, uh, the steady state. Why? Because this guy is positive, then all the other fellows are positive. Okay. The first one is positive, so when I take 4 pi squared, if d pi squared l squared minus a is positive, then d 4 pi squared l squared minus a is positive, uh, 9 pi squared l squared times d minus a is positive and so on and so forth. Okay, Because I am just increasing this guy, the positive fellow. This is of course a positive term, diffusion coefficient number is positive. Okay, So this guy is uh, positive and keeps on increasing. Then we have stability for the, for the steady state. Um, since for all n, lambda n squared is greater than 0. Okay, Which means d must be greater than L squared A divided by pi squared and that is the threshold value, that is the critical value of the diffusion coefficient. If it was for a given slab, for a given reaction which is decided by the rate constant A, for a given reaction decided by, which decides A, for a given slab which decides what the thickness is L, geometry is fixed, the, the kinetics is fixed and the diffusion coefficient is the only other parameter. If the diffusion coefficient is greater than this number, okay, then you have a stable solution for USS equal to 0. Okay. And that is basically what we said earlier. Remember, if the diffusion coefficient is very large, then you would have the any concentration variation which is present in the slab will get smeared out because diffusion will flatten it because that is what diffusion does. If you, if you have a room where there is a concentration gradient and you just leave it, diffusion is going to make it all equal. Okay? If the diffusion is greater than this critical value, you have a stable steady state. If the diffusion coefficient is less than this critical value, then this guy 
is going to be negative. These guys, we don't care. These guys could be positive, negative. The first guy to become negative is going to be this. The first lambda n squared which becomes negative will correspond to n equal to 1. This is the first guy. All these guys will be positive. This guy will become negative first, then this guy will become negative as you keep uh, lowering d. Okay? So, the first guy to become negative will be this guy. If this becomes negative, then remember the solution is going to grow exponentially. Okay? So, that is basically the onset of instability which means your uss equal to 0 is not going to be observed if the diffusion coefficient is lower than this value. If the diffusion coefficient is less, you will have a non-zero solution, you will have some function. You get some idea about how that function is by looking at the corresponding value of the uh, Eigen function here, sin n pi x by L. Sin n pi x by L tells you how the spatial variation is going to be of the uh, non-zero solution. So, the non-zero solution that you are going to get is going to be of the form corresponding to n equal to 1 is going to be of the form sin pi x by L. It is going to go to 0 at the two ends and it is going to have one uh, kind of hump in the middle. Okay? So, that is that is basically what the information is which is present in the Eigen function. So, now I am um, just going to write this thing down and uh, so, if d is greater than l squared a by pi squared diffusion is fast that means concentration get smeared out and we have a uniform solution which can be observed and that is stable. Okay? If d is greater than l squared a by pi squared, then all the lambda n squared, lambda n squared are greater than 0. Okay? And therefore, the solution is stable. Once, it, when d is less than l squared a by pi squared, just slightly less than, okay. Uh, I should say uh, is equal to L squared A by pi squared minus epsilon, where epsilon is positive, okay, where epsilon is positive and small. So, it is slightly less than this, then what happens? Only lambda 1 squared is negative all other lambda n squared are that is for n equals 2 to infinity are positive. Okay. When it is slightly less, when it is slightly less, only lambda 1 will be negative, lambda 1 squared. Lambda 2 squared is multiplied by 4. So, that guy will still be positive. Okay? All others are positive. So, what, what that means is, supposing you have a disturbance and you resolve it in ter uh, terms of sin pi x by L, sin 2 pi x by L, sin 4 pi x by L, the thing which is going to grow is the one corresponding to sin pi x by L, corresponding to n equal to 1. That is the only mode which is going to grow. The modes corresponding to n equal to 2, 3, 4, 5, they are going to decay. So, as, as a result, what you are going to observe in your system is going to be the solution which corresponds to sin pi x by L. Okay? So, that is the insight which you are getting. The solution 
observed as t tends to infinity when d is slightly less, I do not know how to write slightly less, but slightly less than uh, a l squared by pi squared will have a spatial dependency of the form sin pi x by l because only corresponding to n equal to 1 is going to grow okay since only n equal to 1 grows all other ends decay okay so what this means is you will get something like a solution for u which has got some kind of a non zero value inside maybe the single maxima okay so i think this is uh, just to illustrate to you that you have a critical value so there are two processes which are taking place one is a reaction process one is a diffusion process okay if the diffusion process is slow if the diffusion coefficient is very low then you will have a non zero solution but if the diffusion is very fast then you have spatial homogeneity and that solution is stable okay that's what physically you expect but what the theory what the mathematics allows you to do is try to get you what this critical value is of the diffusion coefficient okay and so what this means is if you actually have to plot so if we made a plot of let us say u versus d okay and let us say we are plotting u at the center point u at the u at x equals l by d l by 2 the steady state solution hmm? as a function of d what do I have for high values of d I know that 0 is my solution which is stable what I am going to observe is 0 okay so this is the value of the solution that I am going to observe this is u s s equal to 0 so u s s equal to 0 is along this line my u s s is 0 means everywhere it is 0 therefore at the center point also it is going to be 0 okay so I'm, what I am doing is I am trying to represent how the steady state depends upon the parameter d so the point is u s s equal to 0 lies on this line so u s s equals 0 lies on this line and this is true for all d all the values of diffusion coefficient of course we do not want to go to negative diffusion coefficient because that does not make sense the point I am trying to make here is this guy is this is let us say my critical value what is my critical value a l squared by pi squared and that is a number which I can calculate and I am just putting a plot there I am saying that when d is less than this I am not going to observe this whereas I will get some, some other non-zero value inside my uh, pellet inside my catalyst slab and I want to represent that non-zero value so I am just taking the value at a particular point and so let us say it is going to be a positive value it is going to be some non-zero value which may be keeping on increasing so as I keep decreasing the diffusion coefficient the value the magnitude of the concentration at the center of the pellet is going to keep on increasing okay the further I go away from this the more is going to be the value at the center so what we normally do to represent this kind of um, pictures we want to represent the stability information also on this kind of a picture okay so uh, the way this is classically done is this this is just to tell you that whenever I have 
a solid line that represent a stable steady state solution. When I have a dashed line, I have an unstable steady state solution. So, this is a stable steady state. Okay. This is an unstable steady state. Okay. When this particular steady, so when the steady state, when the D is sufficiently large, I get the stable, uh, stable steady state. I can actually observe it experimentally. But if you keep on decreasing uh, the diffusion coefficient, calculation tells you that the steady state is unstable. So what does it mean? Does it mean the catalyst is going to vaporize, or does it mean something else is going to happen? Nothing crazy like that is going to happen, right? So what's going to happen is they're going to have a non-zero solution. Okay, and that means this non-zero solution now is going to be the steady uh, solution because that's what you're going to actually observe experimentally. So that's the reason I've drawn this uh, solid line. This is a non-zero stable solution. I'm telling you that this particular branch which I'm getting is a another solution. Okay, and if you want, you can calculate this other solution by doing a finite difference scheme for the partial differential equation or for the ODE equation. You can just solve it by using some method, some numerical method because it's a nonlinear equation, and you can get this branch. But this is also a steady solution, but this will be observed only when the diffusion coefficient is sufficiently low. If the diffusion coefficient is sufficiently large, this guy will not exist. This guy will collapse to u equal to 0. So, this kind of a diagram where I am trying to represent the behavior of a particular system or the solution versus a parameter is called a bifurcation diagram. Okay. So, this bifur this is what I have drawn here is actually a bifurcation diagram. So, this is a bifurcation diagram. Okay. And what does a bifurcation diagram do? This diagram depicts how a state or a solution changes with a parameter okay and uh, the stability information is also captured and uh, i'm going to redraw that thing which i had drawn earlier and this is d equals uh, l squared a by pi this particular point where you have the change from one branch to another is called a bifurcation point so the bifurcation point is the point where a new solution branch is emerging Okay, so I have this is a solution, a steady state solution which always exists. Okay, because you will put u s s equal to zero, it satisfies the equation always, no matter for all values of a, d, and l. You, however, want to know if you can actually experimentally actually observe that steady state, and that's where the question of stability comes in. Then you do the linear stability analysis, and then it tells you only if diffusion coefficient is sufficiently large, more than this critical value, you will actually ob experimentally observe. And this is being shown by a solid line. For lower values of diffusion coefficient, I have this dashed line. But what happens? I mean, when the diffusion coefficient is low, clearly there has to be some kind of reaction going on. Something has to be happening in the pellet, right? So there has to be some other solution which is going to be present in the system. And that other solution is going to be of the form sine pi x by L. And that's what the linear stability analysis tells you. So you get a non-zero value for the concentration inside the pellet. And this non-zero value I'm just depicting in the form of this kind of a parabola. 
physically I expect that the further I go away, the more is going to be the amplitude. Correct. As I come closer, it should collapse to zero. So as I go away, it should be more. So I'm just drawing it in the form of this kind of a parabola to tell you that this is the kind of a parabolic dependency this uh, solution has. Okay. So that's uh, basically uh, it as far as this particular problem is concerned. Okay. Um, I don't know if I uh, jumped uh, too fast when I wrote down this uh, eigenvalue thing, but you can solve that linear equation for capital X in different ways, you will get the same conclusion. Okay, if you get a different conclusion, then what you have done is wrong. If you come to the same conclusion, then what you have done is okay. okay? Um, so, what we have seen is how varying a parameter, of course, experimentally, you cannot really vary diffusion coefficient. That is a very difficult parameter for you to vary. And the only way you can vary a diffusion coefficient is by either making the pores bigger or by changing the gas. So, but this is just to illustrate the concept. But maybe what you can do is uh, think of varying the length of the slab. Okay. So, if the length is going to be uh, sufficiently low, you will have a spatially uniform solution because the distance to which it has to diffuse is lower. If the thickness of the slab is very large, that means the diffusion resistance is high. So, you can just invert the problem and then say talk in terms of the thickness of the slab for which you want to get a uniform solution. So, this may have some implications especially if you have a non isothermal reactor where you may want to keep the temperature uniform for example, because you may not want to have the, the temperature go too high inside the uh, catalyst okay? for other reasons like maybe undesired side reactions are taking place. So, uh, the, but the essential idea is when you do a linear stability analysis, what you can do is you can find these kind of transition points where uh, a solution becomes unstable, a new solution is emerging okay? and uh, this will correspond to some basic change in the physics of the process. Something which was dominating, diffusion which was faster has now become slower and that is basically what is caused and it is the relative rate of diffusion and reaction rate that you always have to look at. Okay? So, uh, we will stop with this for now. And uh, we will move on to uh, a problem in fluid mechanics, which is again going to be a partial differential equation, but with a uh, system of equations and then we will solve. And that particular problem that we will be looking at is uh, the problem of natural convection, which is called the rayleigh binard problem. That is, uh, will have only one fluid, but it will have two solid walls and therefore, it will be part of the multiphase flow scores, right? And then we will have uh, actual two phase, two liquids. Okay.